Let me point to this fact that when in East Palestine, when people were evacuated from the town after this derailment, it was then declared safe that they could go back home. And as I mentioned, there's all these reports of people talking about their pets dying, their chickens dying, you know, they're finding dead fish in the creek. Uh, they're, um, they're experiencing all kinds of side effects, right? Physical side effects. They're very worried about drinking the water. So they're told by a regulatory agency, the EPA, I believe, like, it's fine to go home. The water's safe. You're okay. And they're like, no, <laughs> obviously it's not. Um, I'm sure there's plenty of uh, more independent testing that's being done to verify that that uh, that recognition that they have. So my question is, is regarding the role of these regulatory agencies, they, their role is to, quote, regulate the railroad industry. But it seems like they're just partners in sort of giving that rubber stamp of approval of like, you're very dangerous and very unsafe. Like technically you shouldn't be doing what you're doing, but we're going to give you this stamp of approval so you can continue doing it for the enormous amount of profits that you're making quarterly on this. So I'm curious what role, like, you know, as you mentioned, you came to these, um, these hearings looking at how they're trying to regulate the industry. You had this sort of naive assumption of how this was supposed to work, which is something I think a lot of people would feel when they first enter into one of those things. Um, what was revealed to you about how the regulatory in, uh, regulatory agencies actually operate and how they work in uh, work with the railroad industry? Yeah, the, and that that's the thing that was most surprising to me. And I I had some uh, experience in corporate America uh, in my background, so I I understand how some of these things work. Uh, but I was shocked by how. Um, when the regulatory process started and said, how can we make these trains safer? Um, in, in the public meetings, the ones that you know we were allowed to attend, every time, every meeting, the, someone from the American Petroleum Institute and someone from the Association of American Railroads were seated right at the table and often leading the discussion about how we would make these new regulations. So you know, recall that I just said one of these lobbyists got an award for right. laying safety regulations. And yet they're the ones at the table with their lawyers saying, nope, we're, that's unacceptable. And so when these regulations were being made um, for oil oil trains, but you know, which were, they were more broadly for high hazard uh, trains, uh, that uh, the, the oil industry and the rail industry got together and wrote a letter to the, the Department of Transportation who, who Basically, there's the Department of Transportation that uh, includes the Federal Railroad Administration, which then also includes FIMSA, which is the Pipeline and Hazardous Materials Safety Administration. FIMSA is the actual group that makes these regulations. Mm -hmm. uh, but they got a letter from both industries saying, yeah, we're, we're willing to work with you on this. Uh, but there are two things we're not willing to accept. We will not accept speed limits, and we will not accept you making us stabilize the oil before we put it in these trains. Uh, now, uh, I argue uh, and, and argued for years that stabilizing that oil was the only sensible thing to do, because then when you have an you'll have an environmental disaster, you'll have an oil spill, but you won't burn down a town and kill 47 people. Uh, and so that's the um, but that's what they did. And, and that's what they got. So they they set the rules of we'll negotiate about some things. Uh, but, the, you know, there are certain things that just you you we're not going to accept being regulated on. Uh, so that's that's um, that's the power that they have. And that's where I, I was just I just figured regulations were based on science, you know, and, and you know, the best the best we the best we knew like, oh, yeah, we, sh we shouldn't be doing this. This is unsafe. Uh, but no, it's not. And, um, and and so that's that's where I, I was very naive. Uh, and 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 actually, the science is perverted, and and these lobbyists, um, just like they're now saying these modern brakes don't work, you know, the the, the electronic modern brakes don't work. They're just lying. They're they, but they can always come up with a study. Mm -hmm. They always have a, waving a study. Say, look at this study that says they don't work. A study that you paid for, <laughs> right? You know, so um, mm -hmm. there's never an it's never an independent peer reviewed study. So it's a huge thing we're up against. And 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 the, a phrase that they use constantly is the science is still out on this issue. You know, it's something that they used. It's the same thing they did with climate change. 
Like, yeah, we're not sure why these trains are exploding. We're, we're, we need to study it some more. So that, that's the level of absurdity that we're dealing with, where the oil industry was saying, we don't understand crude oil. In, you know, in 2015, we, we're mm -hmm. not really sure why this is happening. We need to study it. It's absurd. And, mm -hmm. and there was, a, there was a, a petroleum engineering professor from the University of Texas who called them out on that. And he, he said, this, this, we knew how to do this 80 years ago. It's a simple spreadsheet. You know, you, you figure out what the volatility is, you know, it's going to, you know, it's going to ignite. Um, and he, he, he said, this is total BS. Uh, but that's what they get away with. And they have these hearings and they have their studies that they fund and they delay, they delay. But then what happens to, to the, I was, I wasn't as naive when I showed up at, I think it was the 2015 Energy Information Administration, which is a um, an organization in DC that provides a lot of information about the US energy industry. They have an annual conference. That year, the CEO of BNSF, BNSF the largest uh, railroad that, you know, who, they were moving the most oil by rail in the country at the time. Uh, the new regulations had come out and um, they, uh, the, he was like the opening fireside chat. So he's up on stage. There are probably 500 people in the room, lots of media, lots of people from all across the energy industry. And they said, what do you think about these new regulations? And he said, oh, they're good. We like them. Except that breaking thing. We're going to have to change that. And so he publicly just said, we're going to have to change that. And so I was shocked. I was like, boy, I thought they at least did this behind closed doors. But, uh, he And they did. You know, they effectively, um, I, I've detailed the process they used, even if Trump had not come in and just said, we're just getting rid of regulations for, for the rail industry. Um, I believe that would have been repealed because they had a process in place. They had Congress on their side. And um, a lot of this has to do with Congress. Like these, a regulation can be repealed, you know, by Congress. And, uh, and so, um, yeah, so but just to be so brazen to say, uh, yeah, we're, we're okay with this, except the one part, and we're just going to get rid of that. And they did. Right. Yeah. So I, I do want to, you mentioned President Trump, and I want to talk about him specifically. Um, so just yesterday, uh, former President Donald Trump visited East Palestine to visit with the people there. Um, someone asked him in the crowd when he was doing his kind of photo op thing, shaking hands and, and all that, someone asked him, uh, what's your message to Joe Biden? Uh, and his response was, get over here. Um, <laughs> so I would like to speak of the, I would like you to speak to the irony of this situation regarding the deregulation of the rail industry, the, the railroad industry, uh, in regards to president Trump and his time as president. Um, obviously tr uh, as far as I know, Joe Biden hasn't really spoken publicly about the situation in East, pa in East Palestine. Um, that's an issue, but, uh, Trump is. And of course, this is setting himself up for a run in 2024. So if you could speak to the irony of this, of Trump <laughs> coming to this town, speaking to the people there, you know, offering his condolences and all this, and then blaming Biden or whoever for the problems that they're experiencing when it was actually under his administration that there was some massive deregulation that occurred. Yeah. And I, I mean, I think it's pretty well established over the last five years that uh, the modern Republicans have no shame. Um, yeah. and will say whatever is politically convenient. Uh, the idea that Trump is there um, and and trying to blame Biden um, is it, yeah, that's it, it. It's uh, it's bold <laughs> because <laughs> he, he came in. Not only did he uh, his administration repeal the uh, modern breaking requirement, um, they shut down efforts by states to uh, mandate two person crews. And the language that they used, um, they already had said when 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 the Trump administration came in, they said um, if a regulatory agency wants to put up a new regulation, put forth a new regulation, um, they have to remove two old ones. Mm -hmm. So it was they and it's expressly saying this is a deregulatory environment now, uh, and so they got rid of um, those safety regulations. And when they got rid of the two person crew, when they said you're not allowed, to, you know, you can't do that. Their, their legal argument was uh, safety cannot be a pretext for inhibiting market growth, uh, which is a real, you know, a long mm. way of saying profits, profits over safety. You know, that's, yeah. that's it. You can't say um, we're doing this because it's going to make people safer if it cuts into profits. Uh, and so that was the environment. Um, and that's, um, you know, uh, 
after the Loch Megantic accident happened, a very sharp uh, columnist a few days after uh, referred to it as a corporate crime scene. Mm-hmm. Um, and, um, you know, I've detailed um, there were many, many cost cutting measures and policy issues. That accident never should have happened, but it happened because of corporate policy. Um, and that's what we're dealing with here. I mean, we, we've heard that in this instance, um, again, that the uh, I just I read yesterday that now they're saying that Norfolk Southern has a policy where if one of these rail side indicators um, notices something wrong with the train, like a, you know, a, an axle that is on fire or a bearing that is on fire, um, they get a warning. But the the head office, you know, calling into corporate, they can override that and say, keep going until you get to the next one. So um, it's the it's these sort of policies of putting profits over safety. That's what the Trump administration did. They also came in and said um, that the 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 Association of American Railroads had been lobbying for a while to move natural gas in a in a liquefied form. So it's known as LNG, liquefied natural gas. Um, it it hadn't been allowed to to be moved by rail. Um, they they'd been asking for it. The Trump administration came in. Trump issued an executive order and said, within a year, we will have a regular, you know, we will have a rule to allow this to happen. Um, and that happened. Thankfully, uh, it was challenged. Multiple uh, groups filed lawsuits. But then uh, when uh, when the Biden administration came in, they put that on hold, which was the, which was the only sane thing to do, because if one of these LNG trains derails uh, in a populated area, it's going to make all these other accidents look like, you know, a rounding error. Uh, it's, it's just incredibly dangerous. So uh, for Trump, and for the Republicans to be uh, not that the Democrats are not also um, mm-hmm. under the influence of the lobbyist, you know, that right. the, the the important rules that were not the important safety changes that were not implemented under the Obama administration were the result of, you know, lobbyist pressure. So um, but um, certainly the Trump administration and, and Trump himself uh, has no standing to be talking about rail safety in any way. Right. Yeah, and, and I want to speak to the Democrat side of this too because there was a railroad worker strike. This was it last year, I guess it was late last year, sometime. So there was an effort by rail workers to organize themselves with their unions and say, "Hey, like we're not getting any sick days. We're being treated horribly, and if you care about this industry working and functioning properly, we need to be treated with some, you know, with basic worker protections, right?" and from my understanding, there was, you know, Congress and Biden basically pushed through um, legislation that broke the strike. I mean, from my understanding, they didn't really get, like when it came to bargaining with the industry, um, the workers really didn't get much of what they were demanding. So there seems to be a lot of factors here, which is like workers' rights, the regulatory aspects to it. Um, but it seems like no matter what angle you're coming at it, whether it's from the Democrats or the Republicans, there's really not much of an interest in raising the standards of the rail industry as far as safety, regulation, and workers' rights. Would you say that that's a pretty safe assumption? Yeah, I think it is. And I I think it comes down to, I mean, the, the, the amounts of money, I mean, uh, you know, I, I, I haven't looked recently, but, uh, the rail industry spreads money around everywhere. So, mm-hmm. you know, some of the the top donors from the, the rail industry are Democratic, uh, you know, con- congressional right. representatives right. or the top recipients. Um, so um, it's yes, uh, as I, I mentioned earlier, it's an incredibly powerful lobby. Um, and and yeah, and, and they have that ability, um, which which was which came up in that whole um, strike discussion of, well, if the rail shut down, it's going to tank the economy. Yeah. So we can't have that happen. Um, right. so what, what we don't see, in my opinion, that's where the government should be using their efforts to say, okay, agreed, but people need sick days, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so yeah. like, mm-hmm. can we at least you're, you're paying, you know, Norfolk Southern is buying back $6 billion worth of stock, supposedly, um, BNSF, it, which is owned by Warren Buffett's company, you know, one of the richest people in the world, mm-hmm. uh, Bill Gates is one of the majority owners or not a majority owner, but one of the largest owners of one of the Canadian railroads. Um, these are very wealthy people getting much wealthier uh, while these workers are being uh, pushed. Uh, they, you know, the schedule that these these rail workers on is is brutal. 
uh, and mm -hmm. then to not have paid sick days. It's, uh, but it's, it's all, it's all come from this, you know, the trains now are 25% longer than they were 20 years ago. Um, they're, you know, they're trying to use fewer employees. The whole thing is about, um, they, they call it precision railroading. Um, you know, that was adopted like 20 years ago. It's, it's basically, it, it's, it's this business school thinking, um, uh, that, um, we, how can we make the most money out of this? And, and workers, workers are an expendable, you know, a right. cost of doing business. They're not, um, the, they're not part of this, uh, success story. So it's, uh, no, it's, I, that was very disheartening. I've talked to a lot of rail workers, uh, over the years and, um, it's a tough job and it just keeps getting harder. And, right. and, and the guys I talked to the guys, they call it riding the elephant when you're driving one of these trains, that's like 150 cars long because right. they, the tracks weren't really designed for trains that long and, 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 and nothing was. And so um, it's a real talent to be able to move one of those trains over those tracks and um, deal with the fact that, you know, when you're slowing down, the back of the train is coming up on, you know, that's, it's, it's, you know, it's uh, the, the workers deserve a, a much bigger piece of the pie than they're getting and they deserve to be safe. Absolutely. Well, that's what this reminds me of is at the, I think at the first chapter of your book, uh, you talk about the, the conditions, the things that were set to, uh, for this bomb train, this explosion of, uh, of this, uh, this freight line in, uh, Lac Magantic, uh, in Quebec, which was, there was a worker, he had, I guess he had parked the train, uh, and had gone, you know, he was, it was at night, so he was going to go to sleep. Uh, he did everything he was supposed to do, but apparently there was a series of things that happened. Like, I think, uh, if I remember correctly, some, uh, th there was an alert that it's, there was a fire or something on the train. And so yeah. some, some workers, emergency workers came to like turn it off. And because of just what occurred, the train then started to roll downhill and then exploded in the, in the, in the downtown of this, this, uh, this small town. So what then occurred was they came in, and this is in Canada, they arrested that worker. Like they had brought in like basically the equivalent of like a SWAT team and arrested him and drug him in. And, and people were like, that's not who we're wanting to blame. That's not their, you know, he did everything he was supposed to do as, as, a, as a worker trained to do this job. It's the regulatory bodies. It's the industry itself that's the problem. So it's really, I mean, this has been, this is as old as capitalism itself, it seems like. We blame the the small the the workers versus the actual companies or the context in which they're working in, and uh, it just this pattern is repeated over and over and over again. And I just really wanted to comment on that. Yeah, yeah, I I think you're 100 percent correct that that they they scapegoated that employee there. Um, thankfully, he was uh, after the trial. You know, he wasn't. Uh, held criminally, you know, he wasn't, he was found innocent, essentially, Good. Okay, uh, but he had to go, go to a big trial and go through all of that. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's no one from the C-suite, no executives paid any price for that. Um, and uh, so, the, you know, that again, it, that it, it happens over and over. And so what, what is, um, what is the CEO of Norfolk Southern going to, is he going to pay any price for this? Mm. Mm, no. Probably, Probably not. not. <laughs> Probably going to get a big bonus. Um, yeah. So uh, that that the, yeah, it's it's that that's the situation we're in where where people um, I don't know how they sleep at night, but they've um, when when they made these regulations for the high hazard trains in their calculations, they said yeah, well if we're running as much oil by rail as we expect to, we're going to have eight or ten of these accidents a year, mm. and that was just accepted. So they, the, everything is based on a, in the regulations, it's based on a cost benefit analysis. So they say, well, how much would it cost to put modern brakes on these trains? That's a number we know. And then they look, well, what's the benefit of that? Well, we, we might not have as many accidents. We might not kill people. We might not contaminate the environment. Then yeah. and what their conclusion was, we're not willing, it, the, the cost is too high for that. So they're willing to accept, you know, they're, they know that people are going to die. They know they're going to contaminate the environment um, and they accept that as a cost of doing business. And, and I, at one of these uh, DC events, there was another representative of the American Petroleum Institute. And she said, uh, we don't see transportation as a risk. We just see it as a cost of doing business. 
this is mm-hmm. as these trains are exploding and, and you know, you know, you know there, there, it was a real issue at the time and they were just yeah. blunt about it. We don't, we yeah. don't see it as a risk. It's it, because it is, it's not a risk to their offices, you know, right. where they work, it's not a problem where they work and live. Um, you know, it comes down to a colleague of mine at DSmog years ago, got a quote from a, a, a pipeline executive who said, uh, well, I wouldn't live near a pipeline. Right. Like, <laughs> who would be so stupid to do that? Uh, and uh, so that's the same thing with the, you know, these railroads, you know, they don't live near the railroads. Mm-hmm.